This is the scene from The Office where Michael discovers that Toby is back and he just yells no for like for like 10 seconds. No, God, please, no, 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 no! We are going to take a look at episode one of The Rings of Power, uh, A Shadow of the Past. Uh, and it's just me and Michael today. Dan, uh, he was on vacation, and he's got uh, he's got to watch them before he can review them. But we'll do we'll do episode two with him. We'll we'll see if we can wrangle him into this. Uh, so as we go through this first episode, uh, we have sort of a few questions that we're going to be honing in on. Things that stuck in our brain as we were looking at it is it, is it satisfying the certain questions we have? Those are one: uh, is it faithful to the text or what do we pull out of it that we also pulled out of Tolkien? Uh, and so uh, we'll we'll take a look at that. We'll see is there are there are there those those hints, those direct callbacks to what we know from Tolkien's Middle Earth. Uh, a second would be how compelling is it? And I know that's a really broad sort of question. Uh, so we'll break that down in a couple more ways. One, how compelling is the writing? Because Tolkien he pulls you into his world. I think that's what you said, Michael, earlier. He pulls you into his world, right? He writes so well that you can't help but, in a way, be consumed by the uh, the images that he's building around you and the conversations that you hear happening around you. And so they have a responsibility to try and actually make it compelling in the same way that Tolkien made it compelling. Are they satisfying any of that? Uh, another one is how good are the visuals, right? How good are the relationships? How good is what we are seeing on screen portrayed? Does it have the same excellence that... Tolkien had, or even at this point, that we have to call back and say that Peter Jackson had, because there is a there is a line, a bar that has been set, um, and if you don't reach that bar, or at least come awfully close to it, you will be judged pretty harshly. And within that, right, I, I, like, are, are there more tropes, or is there more Tolkien in here? Yeah, and, and I think we'll take a look at that. Um, and we can start pretty pretty early with the prologue that Galadriel throws at us. All right, so this here is uh, the children in Valinor as they play and they frolic because it's all happiness. She tells us it's all joy, except for the fact that they sink her swan boat and they start fisticuffs. So, uh, yes, bullying is apparently part of the Valinorian joy. That's the that's the message I take away from this. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, right there. They are throwing the rocks. There they come, and then here we go. And we get Galadriel getting angry until her brother Finrod appears and we move on from there. So I know, Michael, you had a thought about how Finrod, right? Look at her like rearing back, ready to punch him in the joy that is Valinor, because they've just told us how joyful it is and how the light would never leave us. Yeah, I mean, this is this is this weird, this weird um, confluence of, of the their attempt to tell Tolkien's story about elven bliss in its early days because remember this is this is um, galadriel when she's very young so we're talking very early on here in the world and they're, they're trying to do that and then they're also trying to tell us a couple things one is um that that galadriel can beat up any boy so there's 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 that also she she, early she's bullied so there's so there's that part of of Alinorian bliss which is apparently important and then Oh, but never mind the bullying because I mean, look at Finrod's fade. I mean, that is the <laughs> best. I mean, they must have the best salons in the world. I mean, they're the only salons in the world because right. they're only ones. What you don't understand, Michael, is that's a shaving knife. It's actually a blade <laughs> for his hair. That's right. That's right. So, so um, the well, so to speak to your so the second part of what you were talking about, Jonathan, or a second ago. This is one of those elements which immediately takes me out of the world of Tolkien. Like I'm looking at this and I'm not trying. I wasn't actually trying to be like, I'm going to nitpick. But I see her. I mean, let's contrast the child actor who's playing Galadriel. Her outfit and her hairstyle. Uh, let's ignore the ridiculous prosthetic ears right for a second. But that that um, her outfit and her hair and every, the way she's acting um, in terms of the way she talks and moves, this is all quite well done. I didn't have any problem with it. And then I get to Finrod 
Finrod the Fade, apparently. <laughs> um, and, and, and then all of a sudden, my mind is yanked out of Tolkien's world because it's clear that there's no way that you can get a haircut like this. Now, is that super important for, for the story? No. But if it's not super important, why the hell did they put it in? So th there's... It, it, if it just smacks to me of somebody who was in a writer's room. It's like Peter Jackson did elves with long hair. We have to do something different. So let's do something different. And they found a way to do something different, which yeah. we'll see with every single male elf character. The elves are young, so their hair hasn't grown out yet. What I've heard people say when people like, like you and, and me, when we, we criticize these nitpicky things is what they say. The problem is, is when you can nitpick almost every single scene at times, right? There's so many little things to come in to nitpick. It becomes a snowball that drives an avalanche that that tears the whole thing down. Right. And to have even just that haircut that doesn't make sense. It's along the lines of like they're telling us there's joy in Valnor and it doesn't make sense if there's fighting. There's um, uh, uh, there's knives, uh, even for me, right? Okay, th this is, uh, I mean, I would think this is before Feanor, like had left Valnor already. And so we're not talking about, there wouldn't be any knives yet, in fact. There wouldn't be any weapons, really. Well, it has point. to be. So so, the, so none of the, no darkness has come to Valinor yet. And we know right. this for a fact because Galadriel's young and she was a grown woman or a grown elf when she, um, w when when the everything with Feanor happened, the vow and the, the darkening of Valinor right. and the, Morgoth's flight, etc. So this is many years before that. So there's no strife yeah. here. There's nothing, yeah. and, and yet there's bully with no strife. So yeah. Anyway, it's it's just it it breaks what is what could be otherwise a beautiful pre-story. So anyway, that's all I thought. I yeah. Well, but we do come to his uh, his beautiful line. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> which I think uh, leads us to the the second. Uh, question that we have is how compelling is it namely perhaps a place to start with how compelling is the writing all right so here's that line from the the compelling line from finrod do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot because the stone sees only downward it sees only downward the darkness of the water is vast the darkness is irresistible vast. The ship feels the darkness as well, striving moment by moment to master. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't even li keep listening to it. It becomes so tortured, a, a metaphor that they drag out for so long. It's, 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 it's like he's asking, what's the difference between a ship and a rock? <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's like asking, what's the difference between a, a llama and a continent? They're so different, it doesn't, it doesn't follow. And it, the, the amateur approach that they have, they don't know how to create metaphors. And we'll see that throughout the entire show. Like the... Their, 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 their desire to come up with profound statements that if you think about it for more than a split second, they are named phrases of stupidity. Like I, yeah. to, to come up with a whole idea that like, and this is going to be a, now a callback to in the future where, you know, she's in the water and she has to deal with, I guess, like seeing where the light is because she's sinking down, even though Halborough ends up saving her. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a silly 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 metaphor and that's being generous i don't know it's just painful yep. to me and you know i've i've read I've read so much better and i've written so much better i feel like even than that yeah yeah and it, this the writers in this particular case uh, throughout these first two episodes anyway they they just seem drawn to these terrible similes and metaphors they don't understand how they work they, they're it's just i blame the downfall of philosophy in in our our modern world because no one knows how to think anymore. So they can't yeah. actually analyze their own, their own connection. They're trying to be, they're trying to be poetic and deep and they just can't. Just well, they've never read anything poetic or deep because all they study are 1990 authors, right? We don't, we, they, they, there's no, the, the people who write now, these screenwriters, they don't haven't come up through a classical training that makes them really get in touch with the kinds of metaphors and the kinds of writing that actually do touch the human heart. The things that have lasted for centuries for good reason. And so yeah. we get tortured statements like this. And it's just trying, it's just trying to evoke like this is deep and this is elven wisdom. And you know, this is forming Galadriel's character aside from the bullying. And and so, you know, there's it's terrible. And then he, terrible. It, then he and then he ends with, you know, I won't always be here to to speak these things or speak truth to you. Yeah. Part of me, actually, so if I had to say something here that I kind of liked, is that it is nice to see a relationship between Finrod and Galadriel. I think that's that's nice. It's a yep. it was a good idea, rah rah, good choice. But the execution, yeah. And now, yeah. now, 
so there's um there's a, another scene in just a few minutes uh of finrod's body it's 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 another compelling image because it's after galadriel tells us about the battles and all which i have lots of um tolkien issues with but why is she wearing a nightgown still in the middle of well, a that's battle? i mean that's part of the problem like so i mean uh, maybe you could say well this was this was after the battle so she's in some sort of burial ritual of some kind and that's what she's doing so i mean obviously because it took them a, a long time to pile up all those helmets <laughs> it's like you know what it is it's it's like the part in uh, when aragorn and uh uh, uh gimli and legolas they come up on the orcs and they slay them and, and they pile everything in a pile and it feels like that. Like they're like, oh, you, you made a pile. We can make a bigger pile. That's right. Ours can be bigger. That's <laughs> right. How did they get the helmets up at the top? I mean, it's it's like four people high. Anyway. Well, that's what I want to see. I want to see the cut back to <laughs> 10 minutes earlier where there was like the three people like flinging helmets up, <laughs> like, up on top. Throw it harder, Bob. <laughs> Not yeah, that hard. It keeps coming back down. down. The other side. Dang it. <laughs> It's so hard to make a nice pile. I don't think this is the reaction they were looking for. All right, let's move on. So uh, it, it looks Sauron, same Sauron as before. But here we go. We get to there. Uh, okay, this is the scene. So here, I'll say something I like. So I did like this scene for one reason. Um, it is cool. I like it very much that it's showing us Finrod's body after being killed. Um, sorry. Spoiler alert. Should I say that or say that? Anyway, yeah. Well, uh, go on. If you haven't read the Silmarillion, go read it. And yeah. uh, it's not like, yeah, just go read it. So we're going to spoil you. Fantastic. Anyway. If you read, I, sometimes I get mixed up because I've read the unfinished tales and the, and the lost tales and, um, and of course the Silmarillion. So I, I can't quite remember whether I'm mixing or not, but, but Finrod is such, um, he's an amazing elf. He's actually only the second elf ever to be, to be brought back to life, yeah. spoiler alert. Um, right. But he dies killing a werewolf with his bare hands. So there's a um, there the, the 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 claw marks on him are realistic. Like the, clearly, whoever designed this scene knew his history. And so now the mark of Sauron that they're going to use over and over again, of course, doesn't appear in Tolkien. Um, and I think it's just a stylized mark that represents Mordor in some way. But in any case, there's th yeah. that wasn't there. But this scene, that's a cool. That's cool that that they're doing that. They're showing her love for her brother, who they've established a few minutes ago. And um, this is going to be the motivation scene. So that's where my like of it stops, because then there's this. And the reason is not that she can't be motivated by um, the vengeance, the desire for vengeance or for uh, uh, avenging her brother and hunting down Sauron. That isn't a problem to me at all. What's a problem is that's apparently the only motivation that this that this um, character, our main character has. She can has no ability apparently in any scene in the first two episodes where she appears in and has dialogue in. There is not a single scene where she's not voicing her one motivation it's like and, all that all she is she is a one trick pony so right. far. and and that motivation is essentially vengeance for her yep. brother that's yep. it that's all she is she's a vengeance machine so everything is about vengeance for her and while i appreciate the fact that you can have a powerful elven character who's motivated by vengeance there's nothing no problem if that's your only like i've now watched two hours of this and she'll never get them back Many, many scenes. Shush. I don't want to hear. I don't want to talk about how, whether I feel like I want them back. So, but she's in, in many scenes. So I've probably seen a good half hour of Galadriel so far. Straight. Right. And there isn't a single one where she isn't in sorrow or vengeance about her brother, which that's going to get really old if that's all we get from her. Uh, and which is funny because we were told originally that you know, we should all withhold judgment because this is a different kind of, this is Galadriel developing in her young life. There's no development here at all. This is just, this is one, one dimensional. So how much does it take to understand that a character needs more than one motivation? I think too, there, there are characters that you love to hate and hate to love at the same well time. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to maybe something more relevant now, I think of Rip from Yellowstone, if you've watched Yellowstone, right? Mm -hmm. He's a character that man, sometimes you hate him because of how he treats people, but then sometimes you love him because of his loyalty. And he has many different motivations, right? He's got the motivation. We call this depth. Right, yes, exactly. And here we get absolutely no depth. Um, yep. And 
it's like they try to it's what it's what dc did with trying to create the dc cinematic universe they're trying to throw in so many major themes major characters major storylines right away that you can't actually attach yourself to one and feel anything we'll, we'll flip right forward right here into her well once again her going up but but right away it's her vengeance right there's nothing more and so there's there's no time to actually build any nuance of like so she loved finrod or maybe uh, you know, she, well, she had her familial love of Finrod, uh, but maybe she, there's also vengeance because yeah, we haven't seen Celeborn, and so there, there there could be Celeborn. But then maybe then you know there there's a love of of her being you know if we were to go back to what Tolkien wrote, being a leader of people, and she loves the land and she wants to be there and she misses it, and so she's torn between going after going after Sauron and living the life that she came to middle earth to actually live because... well there's actually a line that's what's cr crazy is it's almost like they know the writers know that that's a problem because there was this line f shortly after the scene that we're looking at right now where she's trying to convince her elven rangers that are traveling with her her soldiers that she mm -hmm. really does she has, she says something like i'm going to paraphrase here but she says something like no one loves home more than i do no one misses home more than i do when they're in the in inside of the um, tower and and you can say that, but every single thing that you do on screen shows, gives the lie to your statement. So you literally are commander of armies, apparently, supposedly, which uh, again, to go to our first point of analysis, not Tolkien. Yeah. Um, but, but so you're supposed to be a commander of armies, but you have no love for your peop for your people. You're like almost abandoned somebody that was fallen by the wayside yeah. because you and and then you you don't care what they think. You have no love. This isn't like I, I recently watched the series Terminal List, and there's this interesting camaraderie between brother, you know, sort of fraternity amongst the Navy SEALs um, that's displayed in a number of movies, but it, it's shown in this one. Like that camaraderie of people that that fight and go to war together is a well known. Um, psychological effect and can be can show real depth. You can show real depth of character through showing that on screen. I have no empathy for Galadriel. She doesn't yeah. care about her her, her fellow yeah. rangers. Right. I mean, maybe it's because they're a bunch of putzes well, that can't dodge. I was uh, just going to say I, she doesn't care about them because they're incapable. <laughs> That's right. They're, they have no <laughs> ability to they're, actually they're fight. Utterly useless. <laughs> so the, we go into here. We get. We 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 will jump forward to the cave troll. And so Galadriel, they, they call her, oh, we can't do anything without you, Galadriel. And she stands there and watches, right? She's like, oh, my goodness. She just kind of stands there. She's like, hmm, oh, my there gosh. There goes one. There, there goes one another. One. Slam one down. There she's goes like, a third. oh, man, I'm going to stand she's here still, for a little bit she's longer. She's still standing there. She's still standing there. Then he goes what? over, uh, picks stands. one up, slams him against the wall. Somehow he survives I mean, that, too. Oh, uh, yeah, somehow. Now she moves, no, right? Now, like now. 20 seconds later. You know, you know why? You know why that was the moment for action? Because there was an elf on the ground that was about to launch her up. She was like, I got to wait for that guy on the ground. I got, I got to wait for the sword pulling. The sword. Yeah, there it okay. goes. Right. My point here. Okay. This is now coming back to, is it excellent? Does it make sense? And they're trying to be like, what did Legolas do? He slid That's down right. on a shield. He walked upstairs. What can we do? What can we do? We can walk on swords and then jump into the air. I guess that's the next thing. Okay, he's giving her about an extra 18 inches of clearance off the ground, and then she leaps. <laughs> and somehow in this leap, woo, look at her go. Okay, he flips her up, which is, I don't even know how that happens. That's so bad. But he, why doesn't she just jump, right? Okay, so then one, one swipe. She doesn't get hit after everybody else does. Bam, two. Okay, she knows now. Okay, she's there. Oh, I'm going to flip over, and he's going to miss him. Hit him Twice. in the, the leg. Gosh, and then there's yeah. the standard no look right there. And then whack, and then another no look coming up. Boom. And the unnecessary dance of blades right there. Uh, it, she's, she's amazing. She didn't break a sweat. She didn't wasn't ever in any danger. She has... Uh, Nothing to worry about. Yeah, there's. So. She was never, never any danger. It wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, if we cared about her, maybe that's why they didn't put her in any danger because they knew we wouldn't care yet about who she is and, and anything. I mean, look, this is a scene that's supposed to establish how badass she is, right? Yeah, so we're supposed to say, example. "Wow, that's amazing." And there was actually even one reviewer from a major magazine, Entertainment Weekly. Um, who was talking about like if you they made a reference to like if you only want to see how 
how awesome she is, you know, and they reference the snow troll fight scene. Yeah. And yeah. and and I just thought after I watched the scene, I thought I think that scene was meant to appeal to people as shallow as Entertainment Weekly authors or of their <laughs> critic critic articles because <laughs> because anyone that knows or enjoys action movies and stuff, this all just looks silly this doesn't mm -hmm. look like what it doesn't it doesn't make inspire you no uh, i mean one of the things that game of thrones did a really good job of was was showing us the brutality of medieval um relatively medieval level weapons combat and arms and armor and this is just like the worst of all worlds it's not that and it's i mean it's like crouching tiger hidden dragon but you know with the wire foo stuff and yeah uh, it's, it's just it's it's yeah, it's unnecessary. They they could have done this and 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 later, right? Establish her before she becomes this uh, yeah. unstoppable force. Uh, yeah, and then of, and then so, of course. So anyway, on yeah. from on from here. Now we're into <clears throat> she. Her men give up on her. She's like the the she's the only competent warrior in this band of warriors apparently, and then they all give up immediately. Right. Now that they've well, discovered that, that there's a sign that Sauron uh, is exists. Yeah, I and, be, and so uh, speaking of then of that sort of the men give up on her. Before we jump into anything else like the Harfoots and the other characters, I want to jump all the way um, to to the reason. <laughs> Apparently, everybody gives up on her, uh, including uh, Gilgalad and Elrond. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, oh, okay, so 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 this is at the point where she's been given a quote unquote reward. Um, for her for her service and which been according to Tolkien, Gilgalad has no right to give her. So this is which is I'm gonna have we're gonna have some fun with that in a second. But let me just yeah. uh, for the Tolkien nuts here, let's let's just recognize the truth. So after the War of Wrath, there was a general call by the Valar for the elves to return to Valinor. So there was a moment which you could argue that she might have been able to return. Um, um, there, 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 there's some good debate about that whether that that call back by the by the Valar um, included the El, the Noldor that were specifically under the ban or not. That's that's there's there's some debate about that. So perhaps that was the case that she had that. But it said specifically, it says specifically in Tolkien that she and others refused to go back. So she's now made her choice. So to your point, Jonathan, there would be no here. I have a reward for you. Go back to Valinor. That doesn't. That's that's just not Tolkien in the slightest. Yeah. But but to top a bad a bad plot point like that, we have the Elven High King, who is leader of all of the elves, the fairest and wisest of creatures in Middle Earth, and he's now about to give us his reason for why he sent Galadriel back, and he tells Elrond. I don't know if you're going to play this or not. Well, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. Mm. Those winds are dangerous, Michael. So again, back to our comment, I don't think the writers understand how metaphors work because when you have a metaphor that it actually has to apply to the situation, like there has to be some kind of logic that works. And in this case, it totally is the reverse. So literally what he, I mean, well, literally, but what he actually said, what his message is in plain speech is, we had to send her off because she if she kept looking for Sauron, she might have caused Sauron to come out or something. It, it, she might have just, she might have found alone, the evil. She might have succeeded, is essentially what they're if saying. If we leave Sauron alone, like you know, we left Morgoth alone for a few centuries, and that ended up really well. So so now we've learned that if you leave evil alone, everything turns out great. And so really what you have to do is just stop poking the evil. Cause if you do, it's going to be evil more. <laughs> evil. So this, as you can tell, this logic doesn't work. There's this, no. is, a, this is the dumbest seventh grade reason that I've seen for like why they would even have someone would think that that was a plausible reason for an elf King to do something is utterly inane. It's again, they have one motivation. There's no nuance to even his, his, his place if he would if they, if they simply would have said we have a plan and, and this this is amateurish too but we have a plan but galadriel's getting in the way that would have been better than this yeah you know what this least. is this is the scene from the office where michael discovers that toby is back and he just yells no for like for like 10 seconds oh my god. no god 
No, God, please, no, 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 no. No. It's like Galadriel is is gonna poke the evil. No, no, no. <laughs> That's awesome. I hadn't. Wow. The so, Office and the Rings of Power on the mm -hmm. same plane. You've you've, yeah. you've hit a new high. I like The Office better. <laughs> I know it's, but the, this is almost funnier. Almost. Yeah. Oh boy. So anyway, so much for right. the motivation. By the way, you know, just so, just because we're talking about what is supposedly a Tolkien movie, just just to say it and get it out there once here, when Sauron actually shows up as Anatar, in the books, in Tolkien's work, it's these two people on screen that do not trust him and won't let them into to Linden. That's why he ends up in Eregion. Right. It's these two guys. They're like, nope. We can see there's something wrong with you. We do not trust you and your lore and your and your knowledge. Yeah. You are not even allowed in our land. So contrary to this version, where Galadriel's the wise one and these two are the one-dimensional buffoons, one of the one the guy on the left is a, is some kind of idiot savant king, and the guy on the right is like politician um, Elrond instead of lore master Elrond. Yeah. This is exactly the opposite of what Tolkien wrote. Yeah. Well, we we saw it coming, but um, you know the whole standard like, well, you haven't seen it yet, man. You got to wait until uh, until you actually see it. And now our fears are confirmed and amplified. Uh, hmm. So it's Funny. yeah. Uh, all right. So, so, so Harfoot. Harfoot. It's cool. To, it's cool to see not hobbits, right? They're totally not hobbits. <laughs> it's cool to see the things that they're not allowed to say because they don't have the rights to them. <laughs> so they use that instead. So Harfoots. Here we go. The dirty, dirty Harfoots. First the dirty men and then then, then the dirty harpets. I'm okay. still. I don't know how much more there is to say. They just don't. Um, they shouldn't be here. Like uh, you know, um, you know that they had to feel. They they put these in because they had to feel like they had to get them there. And then they're going to build. Sure. We know we're going to have the meteor man, and almost certainly he's going to be a wizard, if not Gandalf. And Gandalf's first meeting is now with the hobbits, and so that gives him some sort of uh, connection to the hobbits, so that in the future we can say like, oh, well, Gandalf was first discovered by the hob hobbits, and they loved him, he loved them. Uh, he probably ended up teaching them now pipeweed. That'll probably come in here somewhere that that happens. And so that gives us a reason to say Gandalf had a fondness for hobbits. 3,000 well, okay. years later. Okay, so why do we have Gandalf here? Let's say it's Gandalf. I mean, it might be it might be Saruman, it might be Radagast, but it's definitely an, uh, a Maiar, right? So why, but why do we have him? Why is he here? Um, we all, okay, if you read Tolkien. Nostalgia this, bait. Uh, they did not, there were, there were no wizards in Middle Earth until for like literally, hold on, let me do the math. Um, nearly 3,000 years after the after the occurrences that we're talking about, 3,000 years until the so, until 1100 of the Third Age. So, there is just there is one line. I think it's in the People's of Middle Earth where they where they said that the 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 Valar. I can't. I don't, I don't have the line in front of me. The Valar may have sent blue wizards into the far distant lands, but not Middle Earth. But somehow they went somewhere. Maybe and it was it was like wait wait. wait. Does it say that they went in the Second, in the second age? age? Yeah. But but it's oh. it's it's right. It's there are plenty of passages that talk about them arriving in the eleven hundred of the third age. So yeah, so I mean that that is clear, right? They were sent there because of Sauron in the third age, right? They're Correct. to guide, not to lead armies, to guide. And they're, they're they're throwing it in here. What they've done, like they they take Feanor's vengeance and they plaster it on Galadriel. They take what the Valar did in the Third Age and they throw it into here. So they're not only comp compressing a timeline of the Second Age. I feel like they're taking what they could from the first age and then creating that character from the first age and then what they could take from the third age and throwing that into the second age because they just need to throw as much nostalgia into here and throw as many things that they couldn't come up with on their own into here. There is a good story in the second age, but they don't know how to tell it because they feel like they have to go to all the other stuff that's there. They could have told something far more interesting, far more interesting than what they did. But what we get these 16 different storylines that we don't care about at all. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry, ranting, ranting. Oh, I totally care yeah. about Halbro, though. He's awesome. <laughs> hey, not yet. That's episode two. Um, He's like, like there's an angry male to pair with my angry female. So <laughs> why not? Well, speaking of females. Oh, yes. Here we go. The new Baron and Luthien. Bronwyn <laughs> and Arondir. 
except uh, neither of them have any of the virtues of Baron or Luthien. And so we're, this is this goes back to like how compelling is it, right? Um, okay, visually uh, this looks fine, um, but the writing again, there is no ability for them to display to us in how they're interacting that they actually love each other. They, they, she gives her some, she gives him some seeds of some flower or something. I feel like it's almost like athalas because they talk about crushing it and they use it as a salve or whatever. So maybe it's like the precursor to that. It's proto athalas. Uh, and, uh, but, but the entire time their interaction barely cracks an emotion other than frustration. Oh, that's the biggest smile we get out of her. He, uh, he's uh, got, and, and, and then, and then yeah, that's right. Puerto Rican Legolas had a half smile there. Uh, and then, but then he's just frustrated the entire time. Uh, and to, to have us believe that they actually love each other in their interactions doesn't, there's no, there's no like small reaching out of a hand to like go there. There's, there's no like sidling up. There's. There's no, uh, you, you, what you can do here when you write this is you can actually write that there's some in language that they're using that they might smirk at or something that shows that there's some depth to what they're talking about, but it's, it's expository commenting again. There's no, uh, there's no relational aspect to their discussion almost. Uh, and it goes to, maybe this is a bigger part of the whole show that we, we haven't touched on at all, is that the entire show pretty much, it tells, it doesn't show you anything. It tells us, Gilgalad and Elrond, it tells us that they're getting rid of her for that reason. They don't sh ever show us why. The, the scene with uh, Galadriel and Elrond, they tell us all these things. Like, they're never showing us any, anything that actually happens. There's so much expository discussion that we don't believe anything they say. You, you you can create relationships without saying a word on a screen. Yeah. That's the whole point yeah, yeah. of the, this medium. Well, that, but that's, that's, kind of, that, that, that's kind of getting into the heights of of storytelling that you're talking about. Like, I don't even feel like they're getting off the ground floor. I, I, I stopped expecting non-expository yeah. stuff a long time ago, but I agree with you. You're right. Um, and then there's, you know, back to the Bronwyn and, um, and, uh, Ron Deer. Uh, yeah, sure. Whatever. Um, her people, it just reminded me like every interaction of all the, all the, um, the South, the Southern men, I guess not quite South Rons. No, no. I guess they're South Rons. Yeah. Uh, but they just look all like the characters from um, Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring in Breetown, like all the dirty, drunken men. And so it, it, like every every scene with the that isn't her or her son Theo is, yeah. is dirty, drunken men um, being <laughs> stupid and, and saying stupid things. And then there's the enlightened elves, of which there's only one enlightened elf, which is this guy. And then, and then all the other elves are like semi-racist elves who are who, who are looking down their superior noses at men. It, re it reminds me of like a World War II movie of some kind. Um, their characters, and and then this the the love between them isn't believable. I mean, you, you can kind of see some sort of attraction a little bit, but I mean, it's it's meant to like there's all there's these looks, but they don't quite get to the point where you you actually believe that they're in love with each other. It doesn't yeah. it just it's almost like middle school-ish attraction that, you know. And then they go and find a village that's been burned out and there's there's a yeah. tunnel. And then he um he had they find the tunnel and then the, it's just the the dialogue is so terrible. Like he actually said, you know, she says, but we don't know where it leads. And he says, But that's why I must go Let's down. Go. He's like, oh no. no, don't say that. Who's yeah. uh, who, whose blade is this supposed to? I mean, is, it, is this supposed to be like a proto uh, Nazgul blade, or is this Sauron's weapon, or what is this? We don't know yet. It's not anything Tolkien wrote about. Sure, <laughs> and and that part alone, I don't mind. It's not like everything has to be something Tolkien directly wrote about, but um, well, so so that that comes to the thing, right? When we the, one of the questions we had is there any Tolkien in here anywhere in a way? So. I, how 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 are they faithful to the text? Do we need a long answer to that? No, they're not. They're I, in they fact not. in this entire first episode, I I can't so think I'm of trying one. To think of something that's faithful to the text. There's nothing. The, the um, names, <laughs> names don't matter. That that's the, like... even even though when when Caleb Calebrimbor and uh, I guess this is in the second ep episode, but when they go fr from Arayon to Kazadum, like they're, it's like they've walked over a hill somewhere. There's that was so bad. That was so stupid. I had one of my kids was just <laughs> ranting at it, and so, she's, yeah. she's 13 years old. <laughs> the plane of reality has shattered. 
when all these little things that you find don't add up anymore. When the characters aren't believable, when the relationships aren't believable, when the writing is stilted and tortured, when <clears throat> the geography doesn't make any sense, it uh, you can't do that. I, when we go in, again in the second episode, when we somehow she jumps off a ship and she's in a on a raft, right? All that the whole thing it just doesn't make sense. And so the the nitpicking that all the you know all those who told us not to nitpick and wait until we saw it of this here isn't nitpicking anymore because it's every single time, every single scene, there is something else. Now I'm, so I'm, now I'm trying to find, I'm trying to like put, play this, this whole episode in my head. And is there anything that I find to be in Tolkien's world? Like, I mean, not, I mean, actually from Tolkien's writing, is there anything? Okay. There were, okay, here we go. Here's a scene of elves leaving middle earth to go to Valinor, which, um, you know, could have happened directly around, I mean, somewhat around that time. There were elves leaving the the. The, the, the way I look at this, this is almost like a um, <clears throat> a bad vision of heaven, where you're stuck in in the ground, like worshiping, singing, and that's it. Yeah, that's all you do. Like, so these are the sundering seas, right? So they even showed us on the map. They ex, they exposited by showing us the map. Like it's a massive ocean, and yeah. apparently they've all been standing there staring with their armor on since they left, which is terrible. And then when Galadriel decides to jump overboard, it's like she jumps overboard and then swims. What? What? She's in the middle of, she's hundreds, if not a thousand miles. I, I, like, I, what is this? Mm -hmm. What is I know. this? I know. Again, it's, it's, it's the, it's everything that snowballs into an avalanche of destruction for a story that was Tolkien's at some point, but is no okay. longer so this. Okay. So back to my point, originally, this bears some slight resemblance to the elves leaving for Valinor. <laughs> Fine. So they got something there. Some of the flashbacks of the scenes of what may be the Dagar Bragalach. Uh, okay. Be best, best, best parts. The things that are Tolkienish to me, tolkien -y, I loved seeing for, for almost no time at all, uh, Valinor, um, the, the two trees, right? Tyrion. Like Those that, beautiful. To be able to like experience that a little bit more would have been, would have been amazing. I would have yeah, loved yeah. it. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, let's see yeah. what else. Is there anything else that I liked? Like everything so, with the Harfoots is dirty and terrible. And it doesn't push the story awful. forward at all either, right? There. Here's the thing. Also, when it comes to, to not only writing, there is no plot yet. There is only uh, uh, relational issues. There's nothing that says here's the grand scheme. Here's the grand scheme of conflict that that is being pursued. We have nothing to. Nothing to chew on when it comes to like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see what happens because this this you know this this great evil is now approaching, and I understand a little bit of it. We don't understand anything. We understand that Galadriel has got something up her butt, and she's 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 gonna do whatever she can, including jumping off a boat in the middle of the ocean when she's seconds away from being saved. We've got uh, Harfoots that uh, uh, don't ever wash and still stick shrubberies in their hair that find a meteor man. But other than that, there's, there's no benefit that they offer to the story at all, other than trying to be a callback to hobbits, yeah. uh, Arendir and Bronwyn, you've got to have some sort of relationship, but why do they have a relationship? Why does the relationship matter? There is no reasoning for the relationship. There's not even much of a conflict in the relationship because the elves know about it, but they, you know, they're like, Oh, you're not going to stand for it. Okay, great. Well, apparently they've been doing it for years already and nothing's happened. So exactly. why now is it a big deal? In fact, even if it weren't Tolkien, I think it comes off as amateurish and unpracticed. Yeah. I, um, I, I, even, I, even honestly, even some of the scenes, like the the special effects, it feels particularly with the, the Harfoots uh, at night. The the scene with um uh, with uh, Elrond and uh, Gilgalad right here, it feels a little bit like uh, a Star Trek set. Hmm. The light is so flat. The background doesn't look lived in, right? There, there's it's like a big scene. There's there's something. The leaves don't look right. It's all it's all a, a monotone color of the leaves, and it it just doesn't feel like a lived in scene. And that happens a lot. Maybe right. it's because it's on a you know we're watching 4K on high res screens now instead of 24 frames a second in a movie theater, and that does give it a different feel. Like The Hobbit looked ridiculously bad, I think, in the high frame rate. But yep. it just it it didn't look to me like a well-produced show um it was i think it was poorly acted gilglad probably my least favorite actor in the entire show i thought he was stilted and bland and i didn't care at all it's sort of like how do you play regal well you play regal by lifting your head up high and speaking in monotone voices with directness and that's about it there's not there's no nuance to him at all 
uh, just like, I mean, Gladwell, maybe Gladwell is my least favorite too, just because she's in the same way, just on, from a, from a, a single note perspective of, of vengeance and anger. So here's one thing I'll say. So most everything that we saw in all the trailers over the last six months were, were found in these two episodes. Not everything, but most things. Oh, yeah. yeah. So so part of it is there's no surprise at all. So I'm going That's to a good keep point. watching this. I'm going yep. to see where they take it in the next nine episodes. Yeah. And um, I'm sure we'll have plenty of thoughts about it. But, but um, so far, it just, it comes off really like I mean, it just comes off like a corporate production. This yeah. comes off. I already have one of my children that is refusing to watch another episode of this because they they don't believe <laughs> the quote that I have from my oldest son is none of the elves make sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and he then goes on to explain how every single basically every, the the elves are supposed to be the primary actors in the the events of the first and second age. At least most of the second age, aside from okay, Numenor. You can make a case for Numenor as the second part of the second age, but most of the and the, the everything about the elves just doesn't make sense. This is not Elrond. Like it doesn't. It's not his motivations. Yeah. It's not his facial features. It. Um. It's not. I mean, I don't. I'm not talking about Agent. I, I hated Elrond. He was the worst. I hated Agent Smith as Elrond. Um. I would rather have another Elrond. But <laughs> that's so but funny. This is not that. Okay. This no. is not that Elrond. And yeah. and this isn't as to your point. This is not Gil Galad. This isn't is this is not the yeah. mighty elven king who would go toe to toe with Sauron, um, and who wisely led his people for centuries. Yeah. And well, this, this, all all this together begs then that we answer the question that that the showrunners put to us, namely, is this the novel that Tolkien never wrote? <laughs> yes. I was going to say the same thing. Dang it. You beat me to it. No, Tolkien never <laughs> right. would have written this. You're absolutely right. right. He would have like, asking. just like he shelved the rest of the rest of uh, the, the sequel to the Lord of the Rings and realized it wasn't going to be any good. He would have shelved this and probably stuck it into the round file and thrown a match with a little bit of kerosene. Into I, it. I don't even think, I mean, you're, I think you're being kind. I don't even think he could imagine no, twisting, no. twisting his world the way these people have twisted his work. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's this, yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. It is. Well, that was episode one. We'll try and do episode two with Dan. He'll come with a slightly different perspective, but um, but yep. we. I mean, hey, maybe Michael. The only place to go is up, right? <laughs> <That's> the, <laughs> okay, the, the thinnest <laughs> silver lining we've ever seen. Um, right. But thanks, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our our take on this first episode. Uh, yeah, we're pretty opinionated, but uh, we're having fun. I hope you had a little fun watching us. Uh, if you like what you see, share it, subscribe, click the like button. Uh, click the, right, the like, thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Is that, if you yeah. don't like what you see, also tell us in the comments. But yeah. be sure to use reasons, please, not just emotion. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't attack us. Look, we didn't use any names or call anybody any names. Right? No, nobody's an idiot. They're just they just don't know what they're doing. Right? They're unpracticed. Yeah. Well, they they also have to meet the certain diversity, equity, and inclusion goals that Amazon. Which has, is why that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, this is, the co this is the corporate element. This is why this yeah, comes right. across. It corporate. comes across right. If we had to say. It is essentially it's wheel of time episode, you know, somewhere else. Uh, That's whereas right. it's, it's not it's not a Lord of the Rings, the, the prequel to Peter Jackson's films. Well, no that's and that. if I can say one last thing about that, sure. when I when I had criticisms of Peter Jackson, it was interesting because my criticisms eventually boiled down to Peter Jackson's take on Lord of the Rings. It was clear throughout the entire production that he had a, not, it wasn't like his was the only mind forming this, but but he was the driving factor. His vision was the driving factor. His reference to Lord of the Rings, his deference to the text most of the time was the driving factor. And when I had issues with the Lord of the Rings in the in, uh, as movies uh, 20 years ago, it was with his vision of Lord of the Rings. When I look at this, I do not see a single person's vision. I don't see a vision. There's yeah, no vision. Yeah. It's just a bunch like of, cor that. of corporate patchwork yeah. puzzle pieces jammed together. Right. Um, and and it, it's just not compelling. So Bullied girl, yeah. strong woman, overbearing man, adventurous young female, uh, forbidden love, right? All these sorts of things that they had to throw in there. Yep. Uh, not to mention the diversity. Lots of diversity, you know. beautiful male hair, haircuts. It's awesome. <laughs> it is bad. All right. So again, boy, it's hard to sign off because we can just keep talking. But thanks for watching. <laughs> like, subscribe. Appreciate it. Uh, follow us on Twitter. We're at Torque. Um, and also check out check out our site. We're going to be launching uh, not Patreon, but Patron for us to, to help support us. And you know, if you like what you hear, we, we'd love to be able to do this more uh, and to get together. And, you know, Michael and I, we live only eight hours apart now. 
So maybe one day we can meet up and then you guys can join us. So um, if you go to thewondering.com slash patron, uh, you can see what, what you can do there. We'll get access to a Discord group. You get access eventually to a message board once we launch that. We'll do an extended podcast so you can see the uh, premiere or the patron version of that podcast. So um, if you've sat through all this, you're probably the ones that care about that anyway. So uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you in episode two. Take care all.